Andrei Roda is um, a Hungarian artist who grew up in Malta, um, who now lives on the South Dorset coast, Swanage. It's difficult to pigeonhole his style, but I think he brings in elements of cubism. What I love about Roda's work is how powerful one image can be. The women that he paints are very striking. You know, I paint every day, more or less. Well, probably the number of hours aren't that much, but I spend a lot of the time in the studio, if you see what I mean. I suppose you could call it thinking about it, but it isn't even that. It's looking at telly. <laughs> I never quite fitted in wherever I was. You know, I'm Hungarian, brought up in Malta, uh, up to the age of 15, then uh, came to England, uh, and I've lived longer in England than in anywhere else. <clears throat> well, when I, when I left um, college, I, I went down to London and taught in the secondary modern, because I wanted to spend a bit of time in London. Uh, but I almost immediately moved back to Sheffield. Uh, so I taught in grammar schools and um, comprehensives for a, for a while. I, I then got um, a, a job as, um, as the ed education curator at the art gallery, which, which is a very good, very interesting job. The best job I've ever had, I think. Then I applied uh, to Bretton Hall College, which is an offshoot of Leeds University, and got the job there with a the title, believe it or not, Tutor in Art History and Criticism, <laughs> which I thought was a bit, a bit much, but anyway. So, you know, I was doing um, teaching up to postgraduate level then. Then, before I was 50, uh, a thing came out where they were trying to get rid of lecturers uh, because they had too many. So from the age of 49, I was a um, gentleman of leisure. <laughs> I, uh, well, I dabbled in, in um, one or two things for a while. So I used to go um, dealing in antiques. I don't know why, I can't, can't imagine. Anyway, I, um, I used to go to auctions, build up friendships somewhere. And um, there was an old uh, antique dealer from Sheffield, a highly respected one. And then, anyway, after a while, maybe after I'd been doing it for three years or something, he said, I've seen some of your paintings. He said, why are you doing this? He said, well, well, you know, just something to do. He said, well, you're wasting your time. And so it immediately sort of gave up dealing in antiques and um, took up painting full time. But it was you know, very, very nice of a friend of mine who um, unfortunately died recently, roughly my age, and said something which I found very pleasing. He said, um, you, you have a very varied palette, um, but whatever uh, things you use, um, they seem to work. You quite often um, paint a stick to a very limited um, palette, um, you know, practically no variation, but I, I never do anything particularly in this way, you know, just sort of either happens or it doesn't. And then when I use a colour, I also then carry it across somewhere, wherever it happens to be appropriate. I also quite like um, this sort of the, the sense of unfinished, which, um, which the way I understand it is that, you know, the person looking finishes it off for me in their head. I mean, nothing very clever in that, but I mean, this thing of um, leaving the thing partly unfinished is um, a very, very common thing in life in general, isn't it, um, in the vis visual arts. I quite often e emphasize the verticals and horizontals in something so... Uh, uh, that painting there on the windowsill, for example, is a relatively recent one, a bit of Carol, sort of um, somewhat idealized. Um, 
but then, you know, I've used it as, as my model for, well, ever since we met. I also quite often um, uh, find uh, something in the, in the painting, which is an accident, I may then develop it. In, in that case, I, I, I may start doing it, you know, into um, a, a, a tree or a bush or something. Uh, and a person who um, bought a lot of my paintings, you know, years apart, he said, um, he said um, your paintings quite often look very different, but I can always tell them by you. And I thought that was nice. I like that. Well, I emphasize um, physical beauty, uh, mainly feminine. Uh, you know, got a great respect for fe women. Um, you know, I think that. Well, there's nothing more beautiful than a beautiful woman. Mm. Well, Is is a sort of semi-mythical uh, country, somewhere roughly in, in, to the, in, in Normandy, uh, but it's, it, it never really existed um, as such. And it, it somehow fits in with my personal history, in the sense that um, Is somehow is nebulous, and that's, that's the way I like it. I mean, the floral bit comes from Hungarian peasantry. The Maltese peasantry, when I lived there, uh, through the war and uh, immediately before and after, wore lots of flowers and a special, um, I think, you know, the floral display is, is very innate, I think, to, um, to us as humans. Well, I, I think all work is um, uh, uh, surreal. Mm. Basically, and um, uh, my uh, mine is no exception. Uh, and you know, the the art lies in in the surreal aspect of whatever it is you're depicting, uh, that which is beyond and above um, the thing depicted. Well, the birds suggest them trends in time. I think I quite often use a horse, and that is. Um, uh, a symbol, I think, of permanence. You know, there it is, sort of head down, munching at the grass, and been doing that forever. You know, uh, so you know, it's a symbol of permanence and a symbol of um, fleeting time. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think of symbolism has to be subtle. If the symbolism is obvious, then it's not working. It's like explaining a joke. The most important um, elements of symbolism, I think. Um, Karen, uh, for, my, for me, among other things, um, Rembrandt's Night Watch. Now, in Rembrandt's Night Watch is chock full of very complicated symbolism. You know, I mean, there's a rifle being fired, and then uh, it's, it was pointing at a person's head, but some, another one of the people, they knocked the rifle up. It's supposed to be a night watch. There's a, a, a little girl in it with a dead chicken tied at her waist. A, a glove's hand, the glove is being held like that, uh, pointing upwards across this girl's body. The, his, his wife died while he was paint, doing the painting. I think that was a late insertion by him. And it goes on that way. It's all very, very subtle, simple symbolism, um, but it's unexpressed. If it, once you put it into words, it, it loses quite a bit of its force. Mm. I also think that um, Quite a lot of um, workmanship is uh, an extra to the person who buys the painting. Mm. You know, so you, you do a portrait and you also do them um, a still life of flowers and um, fruit. Mm. You know, that sort of thing. In other words, um, value for money. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's one art, it's, um, and it's all, all the same, essentially. And it's to do with the aesthetic, not the subject matter, but the way it's done. Uh, mm. You know, it's like a very bad painting can have fully subject matter, but a good painting carries the genuine germ of meaning. You know, I, eyesight and, and poor eyesight is a very important factor in the development of art. Modern art would be very different if Cezanne had good eyesight. Mm. You know, cubism would have happened. <clears throat> Uh, you know, it, he, he sort of uh, co constructed these things because he couldn't see them properly. Uh, 
same with money. You know, got the all the attributes necessary for being a great composer, deaf like Beethoven, and practically blind like Cezanne. <laughs>